You know, it's funny, I noticed that the people with teenagers are out to this service, and the four billion people with small children were out at the last one. <laughs> Even in daylight savings time, God tricked some of you to get you to church on time. <laughs> but all the kids, all the families with small kids, man, they're like, the kids are up, we're going to church. Um, <laughs> my mom was like, I thought we had voted daylight saving time out. What's going on? I'm like, this is government. It's government. <laughs> 2063, man, we'll get daylight savings time out. Um, hey, you know, I do need to, I need to honor a group of uh, people at the church. And there's a lot of people working very hard at our brand new building, which is right there, which is, we can't wait to get in there. We're in the drywalling. We're already starting to paint in there. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome. But hey, you know, it might be noted that sometimes I make fun of the millennials. The kids born in the 80s and 90s. It, sometimes I do in my sermons. I can't help myself. God made me this way. Um, but I want to say the millennials are crushing it over there. Spending time and energy. So thank you guys very much. I only make fun of you because I love you. But you guys are doing just a great job. over. I was going to say a killer job over there. But that seems weird. So, Hey, uh, we're starting a new um, sermon series called Road Signs. There's four things that we think that you need to do in this lifetime to do the one thing that matters that God wants you to do. And so our benchmark in this lifetime, we think this is what, what you need to do. This needs to be the end product or the destination is you are only here to, to, to connect with God and to connect with people. So we want to, in this church, take you from wherever you are so that you become one day a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's what we're trying to do. You come from wherever you are. You have questions. You're not even sure about God. You're angry. You left church. Something happened and you were hurt. And then you got mad at God about it. You just need a little help to kind of get back into the circle of the one who loves you. And, um, and this whole idea that you and I are on the way to become a fully devoted follower of Christ, fully connected with God and with people. But there are these four road signs that you and I need to understand to to get to our destination. Um, the first one is this. It is you need to know God. Let me just go through them quick. You need to know God. You need to find freedom. You need to discover purpose. And you need to make a difference. So we're what's called an ARC church, which is just the organization we're with. And that's how we build Venue Church around these four things. We, we think that these are the four road signs, the four ways to get to you becoming totally connected with God and people, which is why you exist on this earth. Now, now, um, to know God, you're like, well, I know God, you know, talk to anybody who believes in God. They're like, I totally know God. We're going to go back to, to think about it like this, maybe like road signs or like this. There's this mountain God wants you to climb so that you can get to the place where you make a difference. Right. But on this way on this mountain, there's this base camp of called knowing God. Now, what if. What if you're at the wrong base camp? What if some of the, the basis of your assumptions about what that looks like are completely wrong? You know, I, I meet Christians all the time that I think they're on base camp, but they're on the base camp of a different mountain. You know, there's this underlying assumption that I'm going to be talking today that'll be a bit of a shock to our systems about knowing God and where that actually starts. But then God wants you to find freedom. Now, sometimes people try to find freedom without knowing God but you can't do the second thing without the first thing. And so they'll go to a psychologist and it's all good. It's, I mean, if they're good, you know, you work on your behaviors and you, but that's working on things from the outside in. There's this thing that needs to happen on the inside to get to the outside and you need to work on your behavior, some of you. But people are trying to find freedom before they know God. Well, most of your issues are spiritual issues. And you're like, what do you mean? What's a spiritual issue? Like anger is a spiritual issue. Fear, it's a spiritual issue. And so you're like, yeah, but I can't see the spiritual world. Well, the physical world came from the spiritual world. And one day this earth and you and your body and your flesh is all going to get rolled up like a carpet and thrown in the back of a van. And we're going to be entering into an eternal space in the spirit world. The physical world comes from the spiritual world. And a lot of people are trying to find freedom before they know God. Well, you can't find spiritual freedom without knowing the spirit <laughs> of God, because there are other spirits at play here. Now this is getting weird and mystical. Listen, um, we're starting Freedom Group in, um, in January of this year. And um, you can't find freedom until you settle your past. 
And some of you, things have been done to you and you've done some things. And until Christ goes back and redeems your past, you'll never be able to find freedom. And if you can't find freedom, and this is where we go back and we give it to God. And we're like, so that some of you got past your past, you got to go through it. David says, King David says, I, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Some of you were like, I walked around the edge of it and I don't want to go back because it's scary. David's like, no, you got to go back and walk through it because he says, for you are with me. And you go back and you discover Christ back in the pain and the brokenness. Come on, it's, it's going to be a powerful thing. And that's a small group that we started in January. Um, that's kind of our main path to that. But the third thing God wants you to do is to discover your purpose. Now, people who try to discover purpose before they find freedom, before they know God, it's like, discover my purpose, you know? And they're always, they're trying to find it. Society's like, hey, you find it for yourself. That's like a shirt trying to read the tag on the shirt. You know what I mean? Like, we think that only the God who created you knows what he made you out of and what he made you for. And so society now is like, you can be whatever you want. You want to identify as a 65-year-old unicorn? Do it. You'll be happy. No, you won't. Because only God who made you can tell you what he's destined you for. Discover your purpose on this earth. That thing that, look, you're nine to five. You're not going to, you know, very few people have a job that they wake up every morning and they're like, I'm so glad I'm alive. I got to go to work. No, but God has like a spiritual nine to five that you wake up every morning. You're like, I know why I'm here. I know who I'm here to help. Um, then the fourth thing that God wants you to do is make a difference in this world. A lot of people are making a lot of difference, but they're not doing it according to how they're designed and it'll never fill your soul and they're not free and they don't know God. Um, this teaching is based on a teaching by Pastor Chris Hodges and Ark about, um, it's based on the Passover feast ritual and celebration. And there's four cups in the Passover feast. There's a cup of sanctification. And this is like, no God, find freedom. We just put it in language so that you get it. I didn't put it in language. I'm not that smart, but this is kind of how we build these things. The cup of sanctification, the cup of deliverance, the cup of redemption, and the cup of praise. Now, as fascinating as studying, you know, the Passover rituals are in theology, you know what I mean by theology? It's like what we think and believe about God. But the, the trouble with theology is that it's supposed to point us to God and not take us away from God. And as fascinating as that, I could go back and kind of study the history of that, but Israel in the time of Passover, um, when the angel of death was passing by their house with the blood on the doorposts, they just wanted out of Egypt. I think sometimes we use theology and all these thoughts about God to think about 15 things that we don't plan on doing. Whereas uh, Christianity is kind of an action sport. And God is like, hey, I want you to do this thing. I want you to love your wife. And you're like, but Lord. And then the argument comes, but she's a horrible person. And God's like, I know. Could you just love her? Come on, I'm preaching to somebody here today. Road signs. Have you ever missed a road sign? My best friend Jason and I, when you're young and, and single and a guy, mostly the part of being a guy, we'd go on these road trips, but we wouldn't really think things through. So we would always leave at nighttime. So, because we used to organize our lives back then around work schedules. I want to say something to the millennials, but I'm not going to. I'll be good. I'll be good. So we would actually go to work and then we would leave someplace. And so one time we went to Salmon Arm and it's like eight hours away from where we used to live. And we started after work and we, we got there and we set up a tent and then we slept for a few hours and we came back the next day. And that seemed to be the thing. We'd always go through these, on these trips overnight because you know, like what else are you gonna do, sleep? And so, um, so one time his, his buddy Danny, thanks, uh, thanks Sean. His buddy Danny was in Oregon and he had moved there. We had gone to school together and he was getting married. So we're like, why don't we go down to the wedding? So. So we left after work and it's like a, maybe a 15 hour drive to, to Oregon. Has anybody ever done that drive? There's not a lot on most of that road. And I got the 2 a.m. shift. And at like 2 a.m. or sometime in the night, I feel like as I was driving, I feel like I woke up kind of at the same time that he did. I so driving past the only sign I've seen in a long time. And I said out loud, I don't, I don't think I'm on the right road. And he's like, you're what? And we discovered that he had an anger problem. <laughs> and we discovered I'd been driving on the wrong road for like 45 minutes or an hour. Now we made up that time going back because Jason was driving and again, he was angry. <laughs> and it was 2 a.m. But back then, you know, um, 
we, we didn't have, I don't even think we had phones. Um, you must be old, Pastor. I'm old. So, but we didn't have this thing called Google Maps. We had these things called maps. And all the young, they're like, tell me more. Well, maps were made out of this thing called paper. And they were kind of the size of your phone, but then you would unfold them. And physically zero in on what road you thought you were on. Because no G GPS either. And then you would turn the map around to make sure that it was going in the right direction as maybe you were going, but your car didn't have a compass. Is this, are you, am I losing everybody? And there was like one driver and one navigator and I had missed the road sign because my navigator was asleep in the seat. And then as a young man, I got married and Pastor Aaron became my navigator. when I was driving and you love her. I love her. She's great at a lot of things. If she ever leaves, I'm going with her. She's great. But one thing that maybe she wasn't maybe the best at was like unfolding this map and telling me which road to turn on. Now, some of you are thinking, and you're not wrong, like, but you have a gift of God called impatience. And I do. It's to build character in the people around me. Aaron, which road? Am I turning? Am I not turning? Aaron, and Jesus is like, Pastor Aaron, um, in pressure times, she'd be like flipping this map and like it's taking up the whole half of the car, right? She'd be flipping a map around me. Like, oh. You know what? It's never occurred to me even to this day when I'm lost to pull over. <laughs> like to pull over and just like look at it. You know, it's never, why? Like, do you know where you're going? No, but I'm fast. Like I'm getting there. Like we'll get there real quick. Where are you? I don't know where I am, but we got here real fast, you know? There's this thing in my mind and I'm like super impatient. I'm like, Aaron, am I turning? Am I turning? Here's a, am I turning? And then she does, um, she does this thing that I, you know, the whole evolutionary process, which I don't really believe. I believe in creation, but this whole idea of, of like how have fainting ghosts lasted as long as they have. And she like, she goes into like a panic freeze. And I'm like, I know you're not dead. Like. She used to, in the middle of an argument, we used to like argue a lot. Our marriage didn't used to be great. It's great now, thank God. But man, we used to be in the middle of an argument at like three in the morning and she would roll over and go to sleep, like boom, like that. That is cheating. That is fainting goat. That is like, you can't do that. I'm in the middle, I'm, let's finish this thing, you know? And so, so she would go into this freeze mode and how many people are just glad that Google Maps has saved their marriage? Because it has. And she's like, you never yell at her. My British phone voice, you know? I'm like, yeah, that's because she's never wrong. Actually, the, the funny thing is I yell at my phone all the time. I'm like, rerouting, what does that even mean? They're like, you're connected to the satellite. And Aaron's like, it's a phone. Why are you yelling at a phone? I'm like, you stupid Google Maps. Hey, what if, what if your base camp to get to the summit, what if, if, if your base camp needed recalculating? Because what if you're, the basis of your base camp was wrong? And what if you were on the mount, wrong mountain to the first step to knowing God? And, and I think I talked to a, a Christian pastor the other day. And I can tell he's like struggling with a lot of bitterness. And I, he's, he's asking these deep questions about, about his congregation. Like, did we really disciple people? Because I don't know that they got to base camp, which is knowing God. Because the last two years of a pressure cooker revealed a lot of cracks in the pavement. And I'm not sure that some Christians had the basis of knowing God and what that even looked like. Here's a question I would ask. What if your assumption about what it's, what it actually is to know God is not what God means when he says, I want you to know me. What if Jason is like, yeah, it's going to look like this. And God is like, no, no, that's not how I made you. It's supposed to look like this, but he starts building it around this idea and around this. See, you and I have this thing called keyhole, um, assumptions. So every human does this in some area or another. We look through a keyhole and we see something happening or passing by. And then we build a whole construct in our mind about what we think we saw that's happening in the room. So we do this all the time. Like you have a window into your two-year-old and you're like, I know how two-year-olds work. And then the devil enters your two-year-old again and you find out, no, you don't. And you need Jesus and they need the devil cast out of them. All you single people, you sit, you judge me. 
You'll be talking to Pastor Aaron. Oh, my two-year-old is filled with the devil. Yeah, we know. <laughs> hey, but about the time that you figure it out and get the devil out, then they turn three. <laughs> you know, we look through a keyhole and you think like, hey, I finally figured my wife out. Oh, good luck. Five minutes later, you're like, oh, but we build a whole construct. What if we do that with God? What if our base camp of knowing God, we're looking through a keyhole and it would be like a, a, you know, a scientist or archaeologist or whatever, finding a bone in the desert and creating a whole construct of what the entire dinosaur must look like so that they can put something in a museum based on like one bone that hopefully belonged to a dinosaur. But we build a construct of knowing God based on what we think we see through a keyhole. Now, now this is our first keyhole assumption that needs breaking down is that we are, you ready? It's going to be a shock. It's going to be a Damascus Road face punch. Are you ready? So Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul, Jesus knocks him down on the road to Damascus and he's like, why are you persecuting me? And he's like, I don't even know who you are. Oh my goodness, I spent my whole life. I thought I knew. You're going to see how God redeemed his story. But he's like, I thought I knew. I spent my whole life being the best in Israel. Watch this. What if our first uh, keyhole assumption that needs breaking down is that we are, this is how we think, we are. I am mentally and emotionally capable of understanding God and of encompassing God. Just get that imagery in your mind. Like I am, it's not a keyhole. I can see everything in that room and not only can I see it, I can interpret everything that I see properly. I can understand it. I can emotionally get around it. I can fully understand God. Well, that is a base camp that the enemy hopes you land on because you can't actually climb Everest from there because it's the wrong mountain. Let me explain this to you. What do, what do you mean? What do you mean? Doesn't God want me to know him? Yes, but so, so you, you're 40 years old or 20 or whatever, and you're like, hey, but pastor, I got lots of life experience. And I'm like, that normally means people who have made the same mistake for 40 years. I'm like, yeah. Compared to what? Like, I'm not going to live according to the Bible because we have life, we have evolved. Is that what we're doing or are we devolving as a society? Because in 10 years or 20 years, it'll all swing back to morality and it'll all swing back. Why? Because immorality doesn't work. All this confusion, it doesn't work. And we'll go back to, it just happens over and over, generation after generation. Okay, so put your, put your years in a timeline. And, and you got 40 years or 60 or 80 or whatever. Put it on a timeline and then tell me what percentage, if we had to round it to on a timeline of infinity, would your percentage be? I'm going to judge Judy, you know. A zero. A zero. Let's just round it. And that's rounding up for some of you. A zero. You finally kicked a habit and you're like, I am now moral. And God's like compared to rocks and chairs or compared to, I am now the moral being because you stopped watching that terrible thing, but you still got 50 other bad habits. And God's like, okay, put it on the, on the compass of the infinitely moral one of the all high. Hey, I finally figured out. God's like, put it on the all powerful, all seeing, omniscient, all knowing, all Holy, whole, not fraction. Put it on this timeline and round it to the nearest zero. You ready? Base camp in knowing God is admitting you don't really have the mental or emotional capacity to encompass a holy God. That is the beginning place to actually getting to know God. God's like, love your wife. And you're like, explain her to me. God's like, you made it to church with pants on. That's good. Let's start there. Come on. Explain it all to me. Explain to me how the world of fill in the blank works. Explain to me, God, how heaven works and how you... I was thinking about it like this. I feel like the Holy Spirit showed it to me like this. A three-month-old baby, you trying to know God because your mind is so great or your emotions are so stable is like a three-month-old baby trying to understand his mother. 
What does a three-month-old baby understand of his mother compared to what his mother actually is? A very small percentage. Here's the question. If you're here to connect with God and connect with people, see society, this is what society tells you. Understanding is the basis for connection. Not to a three-month-old baby. The disciples, uh, they shoo the children away from Jesus. And Jesus is like, uh, VIPs. Unless you become like one of them, you can't even enter into God's kingdom. So society is telling you understanding and then agreement. Meaning agree with whatever crazy thing I say next or you're guilty of a hate crime. Understanding and agreement are not the basis of connection. Love is. You tell me a child, a three-month-old baby boy with a good mom, and you tell me that, that he's not connected to her. He's not protected. He's not nourished. He's not, but he doesn't understand her. But understanding has nothing to do with connection. But what you and I do is we, we put ourselves on timelines, not, not against God's great love and God's great all encompassing everything, knowledge and power and time and infinity be, has no beginning and no end. And we put ourselves on this timeline, but then that makes us really, really uncomfortable because we're afraid of what we, is bigger than us and what we can't control. And we're afraid of what's better than us. So we put somebody who's struggling and we compare ourselves with them and we're like, well, I know more of God than they do. And God's like, who cares? Like, that might be true, but see, we, that's why you hang out with strugglers. Sometimes. You know, and it's not just to help them, it's to feel... We come in with this huge... Um, see, when I said that, it does something to something inside of you. Now, catch this, catch this. It makes the pride in us and a proud person feel very small now that we know that we come... See, the reason that you compare yourself to somebody else is so that, or try to, try to put God in a box, is so that you can feel good about what you bring to the table of that relationship. So that you feel like you have something to bring. When that's not really true. Not to make him more of something. See, when you get married on this earth, you bring 50% to that relationship, right? But this is a different relationship where you bring a zero and God brings 100 and you get that, but not as long as you think that you bring in 50. And so what happens is it makes the pride in us feel very, very small. And so now we're, we try to approach God and a proud person can't approach God along this line until the pride gets dealt with because it makes the proud feel very small. But God says he lifts up the humble because the humble person is like, oh, but I get all of that. Even if I bring nothing, I get all of that. That's and that's the beginning of a starting point in knowing God. Some of you need to go back to that. Somebody needs to come to Christ again because you've never come to that base camp of the base camp. And somebody said, like, come to, come to church and come to God because you have all of this to offer. You don't come to Christ as if you have something to offer. You come because of what he is offering. And so, does that make sense? You don't need to feel small. Now, um... You know, a three-month-old doesn't feel small because they're with mom or they're with dad. They don't feel small unless they, they're an orphan. And that's the difference. A three-month-old baby doesn't know to feel small because they have everything. See, God created man in his own image. Listen, but the enemy is trying to get you to create God in your image. So what we do is we look through this keyhole and we're like, I see that and I see that in myself because God made man in, my, in, in his own image. So parts of me do look like God and I like that. So then what we do at Venue Church, we call it, you create a Franken Jesus. So you're like, it looks a little like Jesus and a lot like me. And then we sew a bunch of dead body parts on because we feel like society like, well, oh, it's changed and we should. And then it starts getting real weird and creepy and weird lightning strikes us and we start moving around and groaning and we're like, we're alive. And God's like, no, not, you're still kind of a corpse without a soul. You know what I mean? And so, so what we do is we, we, we trade the glory of the living God for the, for what we can bring to the table and what we can control because we feel small. 
But today, somebody's going to give away that sense of smallness and just connect with God. Because God wants you to experience him and connect with him, not to try to understand him. Oh, understanding sometimes comes, but not encompassing him with your understanding and then offering counsel to God about things. Um, see, the source, base camp, the base of base camp is a sense of awe, a sense of wonder that he is all of this and I am none of it. And yet he still wants to connect with me. That is the base camp. And that thing is accomplished in two main ways in Christianity. Are you ready? This is what we're talking about today. The first thing is a personal relationship. Now that personal between you and God and only between you and God happens in three major ways. It is reading your Bible every day, praying and worshiping. Now, some people are good at the church part. You come in, you're all like, hallelujah, you're dancing, but you don't do the other things. So I wonder if you really know God because it's personal too. You know, so there's a personal side of that. And, and if you've never done that or you've you got bad habits and, and you're too busy, some of you spend an hour in the bathroom every day. Find six minutes. Two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. Can we find? I don't know what you're doing in there, but it doesn't take an hour to go to the bathroom. Or take social media off your phone and I'll give you four hours a day. I hear people like, I'm too busy to read my Bible. Then I'm too busy to counsel you. Start, start with something, man, because I, I can tell you what to do. You're just going to go back on social media and get all messed up again. Some of you need to turn the radio off at work and turn worship music on. Well, I have to know what's going on around me. God's like, uh, it's making you crazy. Why don't you just hear what I have to say so that you can do that? And you can stop being a crazy person because the state of the world you can't fix. Um, two minutes and then in two months, make it five minutes. I would like every person to get to this place where you can do 15, 15, 15. Give yourself a year to get there. 15, 15, 15. That's personal. Now let me talk about, see, see personal, my relationship with Arwen or my daughters exists with like this personal thing. There's a time that just we spend together. Now some of you are good at that, but here's what we're not good at. We're not good at the corporate. Because most of our relationship is lived out around other people. Because I have four daughters. So how much time do you think I get with every one of my daughters every single day? Not a lot. But there's a personal time that's very important. We connect. Some of you connect with God that way. But, but here's what happens if that's the only time that we connect. She can start losing her sense of awe. You need a sense of awe in your relationships even with people. You do, because we need that connectedness. And so most of our, now God is like, hey, and you start feeling like I'm God's only child. I'm the only one on earth who's suffering. So version Bible app, nearly a half a billion downloads, by the way. You get both personal and corporate. So I read my Bible first. That's what you need to do. And then I see what you're reading about. And it reminds me that other people are suffering and other people are experiencing joy. And I cry with you who suffer and I rejoice with those who rejoice. And God has more kids than just me. Here's what we say, to connect with God and connect with people. We say you can't connect with God and people until you connect somebody else with God and people. It's not just personal, it's corporate. And when COVID shut down the gathering of the believer together, we lost the sense of awe and people went crazy. Because we lost the sense of awe that God is bigger than and God is able and God can save us and nobody else can. And so it creates a sense of all like, hey, no, you got to play it with the family. You got to learn how to do the dishes. You got to, you have to learn how to serve because you'll never be happy until you do. Now, now watch this. Um, watch this. Paul, he, I think that he successfully finished his race because he never forgot that Damascus road face punch. I think that's what, he just lived in this like. I thought I knew and I'd spent all my time and oh my goodness, this whole thing is about God, isn't it? And thank God for his faithfulness. Even when you're faithless, God can't be out faithless to you because he can't deny who he is. And, and Paul lives in this sense of shock and awe and he says, he says to the Philippians, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. What's he talking about? He just gave them his whole list of like, here's all the things that I was good at. And like I say, he was probably one of the top 10 minds in Israel. He's like, I was the best of the best of the best, and I now consider that worthless because of what Jesus did. He's like, base camp. I consider it worthless because he's that great and I'm that small. And he says this, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the, catch this, catch this language, infinite value. 
He's like, I'm on a different timeline now. This is infinite, infinitely valuable. Watch this. When compared to the infinite value of knowing, that word I think translated means like deeper every day a little bit more. I'm discovering a little more every day. That's all that I need is a little bit more every day. I'm never going to get there. But do you live in that like, oh, every, I discovered a little more about God as I was preparing this sermon. I said out loud, I'm like, Holy Spirit, don't stop talking. I'm just writing it down as fast as I can. I'm like, don't stop. Because what I think is not going to save anybody or help anybody We need Holy Ghost revelation about who God is. Every single sermon, every time we sing a song, every time a children's minister is teaching, teaching people in the natural will not save them. We have to have the Holy Spirit of the living God to teach us about the Father. And then he says this, the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake, not for mine, not for my knowledge, not for how I feel about myself. I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with the one who is 100% of everything. He's like, that's what it costs, but it doesn't mean anything because you gain everything on an infinite level. Then he says, I want to know Christ. He's like, I really want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him. And we're like, no, 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 you can take that out. (laughs) Sharing in his death so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. He's like, the whole point is resurrected. See, when God resurrects your mind, then it can start to, when God consecrates you and sets you apart for himself, understanding comes, but it comes after obedience. And God starts day by day, sanctifying you, getting you a little closer. But the whole assumption underneath it all is like a sense of awe of just being with him. And like, he still loves and he's still here. And I don't know why, but I like it. I can't feel my face when I'm with, come on now, come on now. And I I don't need to understand why you love me. I just need you to love me. He says, I don't mean to say I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on. He's like, I'm good at one thing. I'm pretty tenacious. I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. Why? Because some of them were saying, hey, I've achieved it. He's like, I haven't. So you haven't. Unless God is using you to write half of the New Testament but I've read your Facebook posts. And... <laughs> Don't apply for the New Testament position. Watch what he says. I do one thing. He says, I focus on this one thing. Now, if LeBron James is going to teach you how to play basketball and he's like, I do one thing. And you're like, I got my own training program. He's like, okay. <laughs> Paul the apostle, probably the best Christ follower that we've ever had said, I do one thing. You ready? He goes, this is the preamble. I forget what's behind me. And I look ahead. It's like all the good, the bad, and the ugly. I, all the, my sins have been forgiven. My past, all the good things I did, I also leave there. I look ahead, and he says, I press on. He says, I, 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 forgetting the past, I press on to reach the end of the race. He's like, it's not about winning. Watch this. To reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. And then it says, whoa, whoa, whoa. catch that, though. It's calling us. That's the trick. It's calling us. He's like, it's not calling me. I'm not there to win that race because if I don't get there with you, I'm not finishing my race. It's corporate. He's like, it's not just about me knowing God and me experiencing all that God is me getting there with you. And if I sum it by myself, that's still a failure because I need to go there with you (laughs) connecting with God and people. Have I read this yet? Oh, you went back. Very good. Thank you. Let us who are spiritually mature. Come on up worship team. This is my favorite verse. I might end it here. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree, on some point, I believe God will face punch you on the road to your Damascus. (laughs) You know what he's saying? He's giving you a, a benchmark for maturity, spiritual maturity. He said, let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. He's like, I just showed you where base camp is. If you're spiritual and mature, just say yes and go there and start there. He's like, if you disagree, your life will be hard and you'll be in for a shock. He's saying a spiritual person can agree whether they understand or give assent to, they can actually tell themselves to agree. Why? Because God said it. That's what faith is. It's just saying like, I believe what you said, so let's do that. You know why a baby is connected? A three-month-old baby? 
because they have great faith in mom. But here's the other thing. They go wherever mom goes. They don't have their own little plan going on. They do, and then they cry, and then they... But a spiritually mature three-month-old baby just goes wherever mom goes. Hey, wherever dad goes, we're good. And Paul is like, I finally discovered the trick to connectedness. He's like, I discovered it. It started on the day on the road to Damascus when I realized I didn't know anything and I didn't bring anything to this party. But he's like, I'm just a three-month-old baby and my dad is dad. And I just get to be there with him. And somebody needs to recommit their life to Christ on that basis. Because you came on a different basis. That's not the base camp of knowing God at all. You just need to get to this place where you're like, yeah, you're right, God. When my hands hold things, they fall apart. But you hold all things together.